Hello and welcome to Different Types of FSA Loans. This webinar is a project of MOSES in partnership with the Farm Service Agency. My name is Lauren Langworthy and I'm the Program Director here at MOSES. The goal of today's webinar is to walk you through the different sorts of FSA loans, a little primer on whether or not you might be eligible for them, and what sorts of projects they might be useful in accomplishing. If you have further questions, we always recommend that you contact FSA, but hopefully this will give you a good idea of where to start. Well, let's begin. The first big question is what exactly is FSA? Well, FSA stands for the Farm Service Agency. They have a host of different programs, including Organic Certification Cost Share, the Conservation Reserve Program, also known as CRP, they do crop reporting, and they have quite a few different loan programs. Now those loan programs are what we're going to be focusing on today. And what's the purpose of those loan programs? Well, FSA is considered the lender of first opportunity. That means if you've had a hard time getting commercial lending from a, a bank or a credit union in your area for your farm project, FSA might be a good fit for you. They're offering a support for those farmers who have an issue getting commercial lending, um, but they're also hoping that eventually their loans will help you to qualify in the future for um, access to other commercial lending. So FSA doesn't want to be your only lender forever, but they're hoping to give you a good foothold so that you can move forward in your farm business and access other lines of credit. Now, another big question that's going to come up is whether or not your particular project is going to qualify for an FSA loan. We're going to touch briefly on general eligibility requirements in this webinar, and we're going to talk about some of the specific requirements that are associated with each different type of loan. But if you have questions about this, or if your situation is a little bit nebulous, a little unclear, um, you can go ahead and contact your local FSA office to ask those questions, and they'll be able to help you understand a little bit more fully. The other big question is, like I just said, where do I go if I have additional questions about these uh, programs? Um, the first thing that I would recommend is going to the FSA website. Now that's fsa.usda.gov. That website has a whole host of information on it, um, including meet, meet a farmer profiles, uh, they have the application forms, they have in-depth information on a bunch of these loans, and also you can find your local office through uh, one of the profile or one of the buttons on the FSA page. So I would recommend checking that out. Um, if after checking that out that website, you still have questions or you think you're pretty sure that you want one of these loans, that's a good time to reach out to that FSA office for that personalized information or for specific questions. Well, let's get started on these loans. The loans offered by FSA break into two main categories. We have direct loans and guaranteed loans. Now, direct loans, basically what's happening is that FSA is granting and managing the loan. The money from that comes from Farm Bill appropriations through the USDA budget. So basically this is a one-stop shop where FSA will accept your application, decide on whether or not they will be granting you a loan, they'll grant and service and manage that loan from beginning to end, and that money is coming through their portion of the USDA budget. Guaranteed loans are a little bit more complicated, um, and we'll go into them in more depth in webinar three, but to give you a brief overview, on these loans, FSA is actually providing a guarantee to support your application to a commercial or private lender. So if you have been denied by, say, your local credit union or a local bank, um, and you think that maybe with a little bit more support or a co-signer, you might be able to get access to those loans, guaranteed loans might be a really great option for you. Um, in those loans, FSA will guarantee losses up to 95% for eligible applicants. That means that if you have issues repaying your loan, FSA is backing your portion of that loan to the other lender, and they'll cover it up to 95%. Interest on these loans is usually negotiated between the applicant and the lender. So FSA, uh, while they do maintain benchmarks as to what they will support and not support in these guaranteed loans, um, they're not actually going to be dictating what the interest rate or the terms, any of that, 
are on this loan, um, again, falling within those certain FSA benchmarks. Um, again, the funding for these loans, these guaranteed loans, um, comes from the non-FSA lender. That money is not coming from the USDA budget. So uh, whoever is offering you that loan is supporting the money that uh, covers that loan. And again, we'll go into this more in depth in webinar three, but hopefully that helps you understand just a little bit. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that many of these different loan types we're going to be talking about will have both a direct and a guaranteed variety. That's not true for all of them, but um, you'll see in a few different locations we'll say this could be a direct loan or a guaranteed loan. And so it's kind of nice to know the difference between the two. So what are all of these loans? Here's a quick overview of the different loan options that FSA offers. They include farm ownership owns, loans, farm operating loans, micro loans, farm storage facility loans, conservation loans, commodity loans, land contract guarantees, emergency farm loans, youth loans, Native American tribal loans, beginning farmer and rancher loans, and minority women, minority and women, farmer and rancher loans. Um, and with those last couple, they're, they're really for targeted audiences. And so we'll touch on them briefly, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to connect with FSA if one of those appeals to you and make sure that you are able to access it. A few other things before we really dig into these loans. Um, I just want to go through a couple of quick definitions. So um, in particular, uh, let's start with the eligible farm enterprise. Now that's something you're going to hear quite a bit about. Um, I'll say your farm has to be eligible and you have to be eligible. Now what does a, an eligible farm enterprise mean? Well, basically, if you're growing agricultural products that you're going to be selling into agricultural marketplaces, you probably have a farm. So if you're growing crops or livestock and you're going to be selling those um, to either a processor or an end user for food or fuel or fiber, you're probably in good shape. Um, the other example, the other extreme would be that if you are for example, raising horses and therefore racing, uh, you're not really selling an agricultural product. So um, that's actually not going to be an eligible farm enterprise. If you have horses on the property that are tilling your land and helping you do other uh, crop related farming activities um, or something like that, then you know you, you might be. Um, so I, I start with the question of, am I raising agricultural products and who am I selling them to? What is my purpose here? Um, if you feel fuzzy on whether or not your enterprise is a farm enterprise, this is a great time to contact FSA and, and talk them through the specifics of what you're trying to do and see if these loans might be something you can access. Um, however, if you can tell off the bat right there that these probably won't work for you, um, at least you have a little bit of clarity before you've gone too far into the process. The next thing we should talk about quickly is those general eligibility requirements. Now FSA has a pretty long list here of general eligibility requirements that apply to the majority of their loans. Some of their loans will have uh, additional requirements beyond what's listed here, or they might make modifications to this list. But um, again, as kind of a basis for our understanding, it's important to understand this list before we move on. So I'm actually going to read through these and maybe offer a little bit of clarity to a couple of them. Um, so the first one, not having federal or state convictions for planting, cultivating, growing, producing, harvesting, storing, trafficking, or possession of controlled substances. So in a nutshell, if you've had a conviction for a controlled substance, um, you might have an issue. So if you're not certain about it, um, if you don't for sure see your situation on this list, you can contact FSA, but um, hopefully those aren't things that you've had issues with. The next one is legal ability to accept responsibility for the loan obligation. That just means that you are able to take on this loan. Next one is an acceptable credit history. Now it's a little bit tricky because FSA doesn't do credit the same way, uh, credit histories the same way that uh, many commercial lenders will, but they want to make sure that you've had a pretty good repayment history. And so if you've had issues with repayment in the past, or um, if you have 
other other issues in your credit history, um, be prepared to talk about them. They don't necessarily disqualify you from accessing an FSA loan, um, but these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. So you'll want to really have a good handle on what your credit history is, and if there are problems on it, how you can explain what happened there. The next one is be a United States citizen, non-citizen national, or legal resident alien of the United States, including Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and certain former Pacific Trust territories. Now that certain former Pacific Trust territories and, and some of these other words in here might be a, a little complex. If, if you are not necessarily a U.S. citizen or non-citizen national or legal resident alien, um, you might want to connect with FSA just to make sure that your situation allows you to be eligible. Next up, we have no previous debt forgiveness by the agency, including a guaranteed loan loss payment. So that basically means um, you need to be up on your payments for any loans offered by FSA, including um, those guaranteed loans we talked about. So if you have an FSA guaranteed loan, um, you'll need to make sure that you have been paying those loans and that you don't have debt forgiveness issues. The next one is be unable to obtain sufficient credit elsewhere with or without an FSA loan guarantee. Now this means um, that you have not been able to access commercial credit or, or private lending um, outside of FSA. Um, it's possible that through this process you will have officially been denied, and it's possible that it will be clear you would be denied. Um, again, it's a great one to talk through with an FSA loan officer with your particular situation if you aren't certain about whether or not this fits you. And then we come up to have no delinquency on a federal debt other than IRS tax debt at the time of loan closing. So this means um, when you finally get to that loan closing date and you're signing all the paperwork, you can't have federal debts that are delinquent. So, um, and again, they do make a little bit of an exception here for IRS tax debt, but if you have other federal debts that are outstanding, you'll want to cover those before you get to that loan closing process. Um, sooner is better. Next, we have no ineligibilities due to disqualification resulting from federal crop insurance violation. So if you've had issues with crop insurance violation, I'd recommend you talk to FSA about that experience, um, but hopefully that hasn't been an issue for you and you are still looking at this list thinking, man, am I ever eligible for FSA? Finally, we have have sufficient managerial ex ability to assure a reasonable expectation of loan repayment. So again, I'm trying to boil that down just a little bit. What they're looking for here is that you have enough farm experience that they can expect that you will repay this loan. Um, if you're taking out a loan for your farm and you have no experience whatsoever with any sort of farming, you can understand that that might um, provide a little bit of concern for them as far as being responsible lenders. So um, put together what you can as far as your experience with farm management, and um, we'll go into this a little bit more in depth with some of the first few loans, but um, again, it's a great one to talk to your FSA loan office about. Um, depending on the loan type, they might accept uh, on-farm work as long as you um, have been active in decision making. Um, they might also include uh, real, uh, uh, like accredited education, or they might um, include farm finance trainings that you've gotten through a nonprofit organization. Uh, th there are a lot of different options. So um, just think about all the different ways that you have interacted with farms in a way that would show you can manage your farm and repay this debt. Okay, well, we have just a few more things here and then we'll get into the actual loans themselves. Um, these are just a couple of, of definitions that I wanted to cover quickly. Um, we have that commercial lender. Um, I'm going to use this term fairly broadly. It doesn't necessarily mean a big bank. Um, I'm just talking about a non-FSA lender. 
Depending on the loan type that you're going after, uh, this might include commercial lenders like banks or credit unions or government programs. It might even include private lenders. Um, and in some of these, uh, even a farm seller, uh, someone who's selling their farm to you, might be able to uh, count under this commercial lender title. So I'll use that term pretty liberally and hopefully tell you when, um, when it's more specific than that. But the next one is that farm management experience. Um, again, speaking broadly, you want to be able that, to show that you have sufficient experience to repay the loan. And you can show that through your education, through on-the-job training, and through general experience on farms or ranches. Um, it could be a mixture of the above. It could be just one of them. Um, but the important thing to understand here is that the, the management is... Uh, the level of management required to meet this criteria is going to be pretty dependent on the complexity of your operation and the amount of the loan requested. So if you're looking at purchasing a whole farm, they're going to have a higher level of expectation from you than if you're hoping to buy um, a small storage facility. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about the projects you're hoping to fund on your farm. And again, every application is evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, so it's hard to draw really broad generalizations, but um, that's just what we're trying to do. So hopefully we, we catch the majority of them in our net here. Um, finally, I'll talk a little bit about the posted interest rate on these loans. And that's important because FSA is calculating and posting the interest rates for all these different types of loans on their website. They do that the first of each month. And we'll be referencing those posted rates. Um, here you can see I have the website and um, again, if you go to that fsa.gov website and go into programs and services and then into farm loan programs, you'll see the list right there of posted interest rates that are current. So I won't necessarily talk about the current interest rate just because they do fluctuate, but um, I'll make sure that you know where to find them and that's where to find them. So one more disclaimer um, for specifics about your personal situation, I really do recommend looking through that FSA website and contacting your FSA office. All right, enough with that. Let's dig into these loans. We'll start by talking about the farm ownership loans. These are used generally to purchase a new farm or ranch or expand an existing one. Um, depending on your situation, they can also be used to cover closing costs, um, possibly construct new buildings or improve existing buildings. Um, and they might be able to pay for some soil and water conservation and protection issues on a property you're hoping to purchase. Um, the important thing to realize about these loans is that they cannot refinance a farm that you already own. So if you're hoping to refinance your current farm, this is not going to be a very good fit. Uh, but if you're looking to buy that, oh, I don't know, great hayfield next door that just went up for sale, this might be a great fit. Um, as far as eligibility for these farm ownership loans, you're going to need to have one of those eligible farm enterprises. Um, you're going to need to fit those general eligibility requirements that we went through. And you'll also need farm management experience. And now this, these t particular types of loans, these farm ownership loans, are going to have the highest requirements for that farm management experience, um, higher than a farm operating loan or some of the others. And specifically, they're going to want you to have at least three of the past 10 years in um, what they call the participation in business operation or management. Um, so you're going to want to be able to show that you've been part of farm business decisions, um, when to plant things, uh, what to plant, uh, when to breed, uh, when to cull, when to sell things to market, maybe even coordinating that, that sale. Um, so you're going to want to be at a higher level, um, not just a farm laborer sort of level. And there are other loans in which that farm labor level is acceptable, but in this one, they're going to want to know that you were actively involved in the decision making. Um, the other big thing to see on this eligibility here, it's the last one, but it's very important, is that at the end of this loan closing process for one of these loans, these farm ownership loans, you'll need to be the owner operator of a family farm. And so you can look on FSA's website for their def definition of a family farm. Um, they go into it pretty in depth there. Um, but basically, if you're going to end up with um, a corporate farm, 
this might not be the right fit for you. We're looking for kind of a family run operation and you will need to be the owner operator. Uh, these won't work for an absentee landowner situation. So if you're hoping to buy up farmland and then have nothing to do with it, these loans are not going to fit you. But if you're trying to start or expand your own farm, uh, this will be a great fit. So let's look at it a little bit more in depth here. These farm ownership loans have a couple of different varieties. The first one is a direct farm ownership loan. Um, it's sort of the regular. And in this um, type of loan, FSA is providing the financing. It's pretty straightforward. Um, they are supporting you in purchasing this, this farm. Um, the next type is called a joint financing farm ownership loan. It's also known as a participating loan. And in this variety, FSA will lend up to 50% of the cost or value of the property. Um, and then the other up to 50% here, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, is provided by one of those commercial lenders, a state program or seller, um, or a, a bank or credit union. The next variety is a down payment farm ownership loan. This one is a little bit more complicated, um, but it, it might fit your situation depending on, on how the situation you find yourself in, I guess. Um, so the FSA portion of this loan can be up to 45% of the cost or value of the property within some limits that we'll talk about in a minute here. But um, So FSA will only provide up to 45%. They could provide less, um, but they stop at 45%. There is a requirement that the applicant, which would be you if you're applying for one of these loans, provides 5% of the purchase price. And so that um, the FSA and you would be working together on um, that up to 50%, but that 5%, you can't waive it. Um, it needs to come from you. And then you might wonder what the rest of the balance is being covered by, and that's coming from an additional lender. It could be any one of those other commercial lenders that we've kind of talked about a little bit. But all of the lenders, so FSA and um, whoever else is offering you money, uh, they can't exceed 95% of this loan. So no matter what, you're getting stuck with that 5%. So that's just important to remember here um, as we move forward. And then finally, uh, there is a guaranteed option for a farm ownership loan. Um, and in this one, FSA is providing a guarantee for the eligible applicant, hopefully you, to a commercial lender. And the repayment on that is going to be negotiated between the lender and you within some FSA benchmarks. Now, we're going to go into farm ownership loans in depth in Webinar 2, and we're going to talk about FSA guaranteed loans in depth in Webinar 3. So um, I'm not going to go into those too much more, but I just wanted to give you a pretty brief overview of, of those different loans. Next up, we have farm operating loans. Now, these are pretty common types of loans. Uh, a lot of different farmers will use these throughout the season, and they can cover a pretty wide range of, of support for your farm. Um, basically, they're used to start, maintain, or strengthen a farm or ranch. And they can cover costs that are essential to the success of the farming operation. So um, I have a list here of some of the things those can include uh, using FSA language. And so let's look at those quickly. They can cover costs associated with reorganizing to improve profitability. So for example, um, if you are realizing that the wholesale vegetable operation you've been running just really isn't giving you the income that you need and you've done your numbers and you're looking at it and you're realizing that a CSA would really be the way to fix your profitability issue. And um, in order to run that CSA, you're going to need a little bit more infrastructure or a little different infrastructure. You could use a farm operating loan to cover that. They can also cover the purchase of livestock, the purchase of farm equipment. Um, they can cover operating expenses. They can cover minor improvements or repairs to buildings. They can also refinance certain non-farm related debts. Um, they can't do real estate. And, and again, for specifics on that one, I think it's best that you talk to FSA about your particular situation um, because it's gonna be hard for us to go in depth on that one uh, and hit all of the different scenarios. But um, they can also cover land and water development, use or conservation. 
and they can cover loan closing and borrower training costs. So with those farm ownership loans, they'll often require some uh, borrower training, maybe in the area of farm finances, for example. And you could use a farm operating loan to cover some of those expenses if you needed to. Um, general eligibility for these include uh, just kind of the basics, that eligible farm enterprise, meeting those general eligibility requirements, and some farm management experience. Again, this uh, farm management experience won't be quite as intense as those farm ownership loans, just because the costs associated with farm operating loans are going to be a little bit less. Now, farm operating loans sort of break into two general categories annual operating loans and intermediate operating loans. The difference between those are basically that with annual operating loans, you're looking to cover expenses for this year and you're planning to pay them within let's uh, kind of that 12 to 18 month range. Um, it might be when your crops sell um, or it might be uh, when you've made it through a little financial pinch, but generally these annual operating loans are being turned around pretty quickly. Intermediate operating loans, on the other hand, might be for something a little bit uh, longer term. So if you're buying a, a new herd of breeding stock, you would probably cover that under an intermediate operating loan because it'll be a few years before you really are able to realize the profits from that breeding stock. And so um, you'll have a little bit more time with an intermediate operating loan to cover that. These loans can only go up to $300,000, which is um, pretty significant, but depending on exactly what you're asking for, that loan amount might shrink a little bit. The terms vary in, um, again, it's depending on the, the purpose of the loan, your ability to repay, and when they expect your income to become available. Um, so here we have generally that annual operating loan will be repaid within 12 to 18 months, and usually those intermediate operating loans will be kind of in the 18 months to seven years range. They can't exceed seven years though, so that's going to be kind of your longest benchmark. The interest on these loans, um, and I guess I should have talked about this maybe a little bit more earlier, but uh, usually you get the benefit of the doubt with these. Uh, either the lower posted at, um, at the loan approval time or at the loan closing time. So again, this is that posted to the FSA website, um, and you'll see they have farm operating dash direct. That's what we're looking for for this particular loan. And when you are first getting the loan approved, uh, whatever that interest rate is, the date of approval um, is one of the options. And then the other is the, the posted rate at the loan closing. Whichever of those is lower will be the your loan interest rate. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but it it's whichever is lower of the two of those dates. So um, it's worth checking in uh, when you get your loan approved and when you get your loan closed, just so that you understand exactly what that rate will be for you. Um, also, uh, like I said, we're going to talk more about those guaranteed loans in webinar three. So. Um, it's just worth knowing that these farm operating loans can come across as a guaranteed loan as well, but we'll go into that more in webinar three. The next type of loan I'd like to talk about are microloans. And these can be used for a pretty wide range of topics on your farm, but um, in a nutshell, they are used to either purchase a farmer ranch, act as an operating loan, they have um, smaller loan limits and shorter repayment periods, so they can be used for quite a few different things, but um, it's best to talk to your FSA office to better understand the limitations on the uses for these microloans in relation to the project you're thinking of. So we'll, we'll cover a few different things. Um, for example, you could put money into uh, some fencing, like in the image here. Um, you could purchase a small property or a small addition to your property, or you could use them like those operating loans we just talked about. Um, so again, a wide variety of ways that you can use them, anything from breeding stock to seed um, to annual expenses. So um, yeah, depending on your project, it's, it's best to talk with someone about exactly what your hopes are before getting too deep in the process. 
General eligibility for these, again, are pretty straightforward. Eligible farm enterprise, general eligibility requirements, and there may be additional requirements based on the specific loan use. So these microloans break down into three different types. We have the direct farm ownership microloan, the direct farm operating microloan, the FSFL microloan. So with those direct farm ownership microloans, let's look at that for just a minute. Um, you see on here that they're used very much like the other farm ownership loans that we were talking about. They can make a down payment on a farm, they can build, repair, or improve farm or service buildings or even dwellings on the property. Um, soil and water conservation projects can be covered. They may also be used as a down payment farm ownership loan and they may be used as a joint financing loan. Um, and again, the limits for these microloans are significantly smaller, but if you're looking at small acreage or, or an inexpensive farm or ranch, uh, this might be a good fit for you. It'll have a little bit less paperwork and it will um, have some fewer requirements. So we'll go into those in just a minute. But um, also we have the direct farm operating microloan. This one can cover um, the purchase of essential tools, equipment, livestock, seed, fertilizer, land rent, utilities, and other materials essential to the operation. So they're acting a lot like the farm operating loans we just talked about. Um, these can also cover good agricultural practices or GAP, um, good handling practices, GHP, and organic certification costs. So if you're looking to um, update your farm to make sure that it's GAP uh, certifiable or um, meets GHP or organic certification um, standards, then you might be able to use one of these loans to cover that. It can also cover marketing and distribution costs, or it can pay for qualifying OSHA compliance standards. Um, again, to get into those specifics, I would recommend talking to an expert, but um, it's good to know that these can be pretty flexible to meet a lot of different needs on the farm. Next, we have the FSFL microloan. And uh, we'll talk a lot about those later, so I'm not going to go into too much depth, but it's just worth knowing that those fall under this microloan category. And um, they can purchase on-farm storage. So again, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, but it's just worth noting. Now to look at the loan amounts here, um, like I said, these microloans have a little bit lower uh, maximum on them. These reach $50,000, um, and it's important to also understand that when they're calculating the maximum loan amount for these microloans, they also include outstanding FSA direct operating loan balances. So um, if you already have an operating loan out for, let's say, $40,000, then your microloan could only be 10 because it's going to reach that bar of 50,000. So um, it's just worth knowing about that before you get into the situation um, that those will be included in the calculation. However, that calculation does not include guaranteed operating loans, it doesn't include farm ownership loans, and it does not include emergency loans. Um, the terms on these microloans are sort of dependent on which type you have. So a direct ownership microloan has a maximum of 25 years. A direct operating microloan has a maximum of seven years. Um, and usually with those operating loans, they're often due within 12 months or when your commodities are gonna sell. But for larger purchases, the term can't exceed seven years. So again, we'll use that example of um, if you're just buying seed for this year, that's kind of one of these annual situations. After those commodities sell, you can probably pay off your loan because you've covered your seed cost. But for a larger purchase, uh, and again, I'll use the breeding stock example, um, it might be a little while before you're able to recognize the, the returns on that investment. So that might be up to seven years. The interest rate on these will again be the lower of either that posted at loan approval or posted at loan closing. And here I just have um, the what you'll look for on the FSA website. It's that farm ownership microloan or farm operating microloan, depending on which one you are looking at. Next up, we have the farm storage facility loans. Um, these are referred to as FSFL, 
It's a little bit of a tongue twister at first, but after you've said it a few times, you can get used to it, FSFL. Um, and so you'll hear that lingo around FSA offices and um, kind of around the community. So it's just good to know that FSFL stands for Farm Storage Facility Loans. These are used to build or upgrade facilities to store commodities. Um, and they can cover quite a few different things. Uh, for example, grain bins, hay barns, bulk tanks, cold storage, drying or handling and storage equipment, and handling trucks. Um, so these can be either permanently affixed, like a, a permanent grain bin here, or they can be portable. So an example of that might be a refrigerated truck that um, is portable on and off the farm, but it's going to count toward that uh, cold storage and um, and it would be a handling truck in that situation. So that's just important to know um, that they don't have to be solid facilities built onto your farm. They can be mobile um, as long as they meet the other requirements. So general eligibility for these is that you need to be an eligible borrower, which includes in this situation landowners, landlords, leaseholders, tenants, and sharecroppers. So um, the general eligibility for this is a little bit more broad than needing to be a, a farmer yourself necessarily. So if you're a landowner and interested in using um, one of these loans to put some facilities on your property that your tenant could use, that might be a great fit. You'll need to be able to show your repayment ability and you'll want to make sure that your commodity is listed on the FSFL website. Uh, just a little disclaimer for that, there are quite a few different commodities listed on that website and they're not necessarily the commodities you would always think of. Um, they, they could include uh, vegetables, for example, um, which you might not think of as a commodity necessarily when uh, you use that term broadly in conversation, but it's just good to check that website and make sure that the the commodity, the, the product that you're hoping to use this for is listed on their list. Um, it's just a little too long for me to go through the whole thing here. Um, there are a couple of different types of these farm storage facility loans too. I'm not going to go really in depth in the differences between them because um, they're pretty straightforward. So we do have the farm storage facility loan. Um, that's kind of the regular one. There's also a sugar storage facility loan and you can probably guess what that is for. And then we have that S FSFL microloan that we were talking about earlier. So the nice thing about those microloans, um, they, they have to meet the other requirements here, but the microloan eligibility waives the regular three-year production history requirement that you would have for these um, FSFL loans. So if you're um, a little bit newer to farming or uh, if you know that your project's going to be a little bit smaller, um, and won't require the whole loan maximum, you might look into those microloans as a little bit simplified, um, easier, and maybe more friendly way for you to get into these farm storage facilities. So just worth knowing. Now to look at the maximum loan amounts for these, they go all the way up to $500,000. Um, however, for some of the specifics like um, these storage and handling trucks, the limit will be set a little bit lower. So um, for storage and handling trucks, the limit is set at 100000 and for the farm storage facility loan microloans, it's down to $50,000. So um, again, if you're looking at, at a truck um, that has reefer capacities or uh, freezer capacities, something like that, um, you'll just want to make sure that you're managing within those maximum loan amounts. And, and again, all of this is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, so um, just try and be reasonable about what you're asking for and the amount you're asking for. Um, the other thing worth noting on these farm storage facility loans is that there is an application fee of $100 for them. Um, also, the terms on these are a little bit different. So they, they go 3 to 12 years, um, except for those FSFL microloans. Those will be set a little smaller. They'll be 3 to 7 year uh, repayment period. So... Um, just good to know. And then the interest rates, again, will be the, the lower posted at either loan approval or loan closing. And um, this one is actually listed under the CCC lending rates. 
um, and it is dependent on the term of your loan. So if you have a three-year um, FSFL loan or a seven-year FSFL loan, your interest rates will be posted differently. So um, go ahead and check out that website. You can get to the CCC lending rates through the FSA website, or you can go directly to the CCC website and find them there. Um, the other thing worth noting is that there is a 15% down payment required on these FSFL loans, so you will have to come up with that money, um, except that the microloans, uh, those will only have a 5% down payment. So again, if, you're, if you have a smaller project, you're newer to farming, or your capital is a little bit less available, um, you might want to look into those microloans for these. Um, but they might not fit all projects, so um, there are a lot of different options here. Next up, we have conservation loans. So these are actually used to implement a conservation practice that's approved by the NRCS, the Natural Resource and Conservation Service. Um, so for farmers who need to or want to implement one of the conservation practices that's been approved by NRCS, but they maybe don't have those upfront funds to cash flow that project, um, this is a great way to get through that project. Um, you can take out a conservation loan, um, use that upfront money to cover the project, and then NRCS uh, reimburses through uh, most of their NRCS programs. Um, many of them are reimbursement programs. So if that's something you're interested in, but you don't have those upfront funds, this might be a way to access those NRCS programs. Um, there is a requirement that you do have an NRCS approved conservation plan before FSA can provide the financing on this loan. So you'll want to talk with NRCS and FSA early on to let them all know what you're planning to do, make sure that the process is going to go well for you, and then you'll need to have gone through that NRCS protocol all the way through getting an approved conservation plan before F FSA can provide the financing. So it's a little bit of a process, but I always think it's worth it if you can get these things done on your farm, if you are if you can be a little bit patient with the paperwork and the timeline. So, um, yeah, uh, the general eligibility for these programs um, are that you need to have that eligible farm enterprise, you need to have that general eligibility requirement list at the beginning met, um, but you also need to have an NRCS approved conservation plan. Um, and they do have a list of the applicable conservation practices on the FSA website. But again, if you are already in communication with NRCS, it might be best to just talk to them and FSA about your plans and uh, talk it through in person to make sure that you're not missing anything. With these conservation loans, they're actually guaranteed loans. Um, and uh, there are actually guaranteed loans. Um, the maximum loan amount is actually adjusted regularly for inflation, so I, I can't necessarily list that number for you right now. It will be dependent on what's um, what that number is right now when you're watching it. Uh, so instead, go to that FSA website and look for the maximum loan amount on the current conservation loans. It will be listed there. and. Um, if you have a hard time navigating to that, you can always call your local FSA office and just ask them what the current uh, maximum loan amount is. The terms for this are negotiated with the lender, um, that, because again, they're guaranteed loans. Um, so they're negotiated with the lender you're working with within those FSA parameters. And then the terms, uh, they'll vary based on the life of the security offered. Um, FSA does have some hopes for those, but their maximum is that uh, they can't be more than 30 years. So they can go up to 30 years, no longer than that. Um, the interest, again, is negotiated with the lender within those FSA parameters. Um, so again, if you're pursuing one of these loans, uh, an in-person conversation is really helpful. But it, I wanted to also point out that there is a streamlined conservation loan application available. Um, it, it doesn't apply to everyone, but for those who are in strong financial position, it can reduce some paperwork for you, so it's worth knowing about. Um, you'll need to be cu uh, current on your payments to all of your creditors, so you can't have any outstanding um, uh, balances that uh, 
I'm sorry, outstanding balances specifically that are behind due. So you'll want to make sure that you're meeting all those payment deadlines. You'll also need to have a debt to asset ratio of 40% or less. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a later webinar, um, that debt to asset ratio question. Um, but you can also find it uh, some information about it on the FSA website. Um, you must have a minimum FICO score of 700. So again, that might disqualify some people, but hopefully uh, you're able to fall within those that range and, and access these loans. Um, and you need to have a net worth of at least three times the loan amount. So that means if you're asking for a loan um, to cover a conservation practice, and uh, let's just say you're, you're hoping for, oh, $5,000, then your net worth will have to be three times that. So if you're asking for $5,000, you'll need to be worth at least $15,000. So um, just think about that when you're looking to... Uh, figure out what, what amount you are hoping to ask for. You'll want to make sure that you fit in that net worth qualification if you're going to go for this streamlined application. Um, those streamlined application requirements don't apply to all of the conservation loans, just to that uh, streamlined process. So um, if you don't meet those, don't worry about it. You'll still be able to access conservation loans. Now I'm going to go through a couple here just really briefly an overview, um, a couple of different types of loans that are really specific to certain situations. So uh, we do have these commodity loans available through FSA. Um, certain commodities have associated loans. You can find a lot of information about this on the FSA and CCC websites. Um, basically, these loans exist to provide what they call interim financing to producers. And that basically is set up to help you uh, cover some cash flow needs. So if you're looking at your seed budget this year and knowing that you're not going to be able to cover the seed budget until um, another payment comes in from, from another crop, then you might be able to use one of these loans just to cash flow through that pinch point in your season, your financial season. So um, you can also use it to uh, kind of the, the basic goal of these are to use them to cover uh, storing your crop during a maximum market, satur market saturation. Sorry about that. I'm getting a little tripped up on my words here. But um, So let's say you harvest your corn, and you know that if you sell your corn today on the marketplace, you're going to get a lower price because everybody is currently selling their corn because everyone's harvesting it and trying to move it. Um, instead, you want to hold on to that corn for a little while and wait until those market conditions are a little bit more favorable. Um, when that glut of, of surplus on the marketplace has kind of worked its way through the system and they're looking to buy more, that's when you want to be selling. And so um, that's really the ideal use of these for cash flow needs um, is to look at how can I store my crop and manage my farm still uh, while waiting through that, that saturation period so that I can sell them when the terms are more favorable and I can make back that money um, and get, just get through that pinch point in order to get that higher profit. So yeah, these loans are actually a collaborative program between the Farm Service Agency and the Commodity Credit Corporation, the CCC. And the pricing in terms vary all over with um, the crop and market forces. And so if you're interested in these, I just wanted to bring them up so that you could know about them. But they'll be dependent specifically on your crop and, and the year. So you'll want to go look for more information either through FSA or CCC. Next up here, we have land contract guarantees. Um, these actually provide a financial guarantee to the seller of a farmer ranch. It needs to be a land contract sale, and it needs to be to a beginning or socially disadvantaged farmer or rancher. Um, so basically, if you are hoping to sell your land to a new farmer um, under a land contract, this would be a great way for you to do that. Um, there are two different types, but they're, they're both trying to support the seller in this situation to make sure that that land transfer can be successful. Um, the first type is called a prompt payment guarantee, and that's uh, set up to provide a guaranteed income source for the seller. 
and that guarantee will cover the combined costs of three amortized annual installments, which I know are some big words, but um, if you're looking into, into these uh, land contract sales, hopefully you have a little bit of an understanding of that. Um, and if you don't, you can certainly talk to FSA about exactly how to calculate that in your scenario. Um, but it would be those three amortized annual installments, related real estate taxes, and related insurance. Now through this, the seller has to use a third-party escrow agent in order to qualify for these land contract guarantees, but um, you'll be covered in that situation in the event that the buyer doesn't follow through. So um, if you are looking to transfer your land to the next generation or, or someone else through a land contract, this is these are certainly something to look at. Um, the other type, uh, the other variety of these land contract guarantees is a standard guarantee. And this one will guarantee the value of the real estate and it will cover up to 90% of the outstanding principal balance covered. And again, the seller must use a third party servicing agent, but um, this one's just a little bit more straightforward, up to 90% of the outstanding principal. So if they stopped making payments, um, FSA will cover 90% of what's remaining. Let's talk quickly too about emergency farm loans. These are um, very specific. They can only be used in the event of a natural disaster, which might include a tornado, a flood, a drought, a quarantine, and they are to restore or replace essential property, cover production costs, um, potentially reorganize the operation, or finance some of the non-farm or non-real estate debts. Sorry, um, non-real estate debts. So the general eligibility for this is that you have to have suffered a qualifying loss. And those qualifying losses really come to uh, either the Secretary of Agriculture or the President needs to have declared your area or designated your area, depending on the situation, as a primary disaster or quarantine area. So um, for example, if a tornado rolls through your county and your farm sustains damage, um, if the Secretary of Agriculture declares that as a disaster zone, um, or if you have a drought situation in which the Secretary of Agriculture declares it a disaster zone, or if the President steps in and, and um, declares this a uh, disaster or quarantine area, um, then that helps you become eligible for one of these loans. But you also have to have production losses. You need to have a reduction in your total primary crop um, up to uh, at, of at least 30 percent and you need um, either production losses or losses to quality and so this might mean that you received a reduced price because your crop was damaged and if that price was um, 30 percent reduced or more then that would also help qualify you so you need to meet that qualifying loss you need to meet that designated or declared area and then you need to have those production losses or losses to quality that made you um, receive a reduced price. And the maximum loan amount and terms for these are completely dependent on loss and replacement costs, so I can't really go into them in much depth. But if so far this seems like something that would fit a disaster or a quarantine that's happened in your area, um, you should really reach out to FSA for more information. We also, um, I just wanted to cover these really quickly. Um, they're for very targeted audiences, and so I just want those audiences to be aware of these opportunities and be able to reach out to FSA with questions. So um, there are a few specific audience-focused uh, loans. Those include youth loans, Native American loans, and then opportunities for beginning farmers and ranchers or minority and women farmers and ranchers. So um, just really quickly to, to look at those, uh, the youth loans are basically set up to offer young people the opportunity to start an operating income producing project as part of organized groups. So those youth will need to be involved in, um, oh, like a, a 4-H or an FFA program or something where they will have organized support from um, a group leader and, and kind of, uh, curriculum support and education going along with this, but they can access one of these loans to um, get that project started. So, for example, if uh, you know of a, a teenager, a youth, um, 
who's interested in raising a hog this year as part of a 4-H project, um, and they plan to sell that hog at the end of the year after they've completed their project, this might be a, a good opportunity for them. So I just wanted to hold it up as something worth knowing about, and hopefully you can go on the FSA website and get more information about it, or you can contact um, your local office and see if this loan might fit your situation. Also, there are Native American tribal loans available that I wanted to just touch on briefly. Um, these are set up to either help tribes become the owners of additional property within their reservation, or to help tribes, tribal entities, and tribal members alleviate problems caused by fractured interests on tribal lands. So if you're a Native American tribal member and you have interest in these loans, um, they're, they're pretty specific, and so you can find information about them on the FSA website. You can also um, contact your, your tribal community and, and see if there's some support within your local area to access these loans. So um, again, just wanted to mention it briefly, make sure that it's known. Um, also, for beginning farmers and ranchers, there are certain opportunities within these loan programs. Um, you uh, need to have 10 years or fewer into farming. So you might think that because you've been farming for seven or eight years, that you're no longer a beginner because you uh, clearly know how to farm, but you still qualify as a beginning farmer or rancher under the USDA um, definition. So FSA will offer some certain opportunities to beginning farmers and ranchers. It's just worth knowing about um, some of the, the loans have specific uh, mention of beginning farmers and ranchers and others don't. So uh, if you fall into that category, contact FSA and see how you might be able to leverage that, that opportunity. Um, similarly, minority and women farmers or ranchers have some opportunities within the underserved farmer language of the USDA. <coughs> you don't have to be both a minority and a woman to access these. You could be either a minority or a woman. So. Again, just wanted to mention that these opportunities exist, and if they apply to you, you should definitely talk to FSA about how to leverage these opportunities. So that's all that I have for this webinar, and I'm hoping that you now feel like you have a little bit better grasp on all the different types of loans available through the Farm Service Agency, and that hopefully you have a little bit of a, an idea of how to take the next step um, toward which loans might be of interest to you and and uh, whether or not you might be eligible for them. So again, I know I've said it many, many times throughout the webinar, but I do recommend that you look at that FSA webpage and that you contact your local office. You can find information about your local office on the FSA website, and um, nothing beats a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who knows a lot more about the programs than I do. So um, I wish you luck on your farming adventures, and I hope that you are able to access the financing you need to accomplish your goals. Have a good day. Bye-bye.